So we were given the charge of um, <clears throat> helping um, or addressing IRB issues with substance use disorder um, research and HIV research um, and also um, bringing your MRPs to the point where they're ready for helping you bring them to the point where they're ready for the IRB, even though you think you'll never have a problem, as I understand that you've already discussed. Um, so, I'm first. So, um, yesterday, obviously, you know, I'm Sue Fish, um, but you want this? Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So my background is I was an emergency medicine researcher doing substance use research and other emergency medicine research kinds of um, studies um, when I became an IRB member um, and from there became a vice chair and from there did some other things and then became the director of the IRB at Boston University um, for a number of years. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time um, both on the investigator side, submitting challenging IRB proposals, uh, IRB applications to the IRB, as you might imagine, emergency medicine research is fraught with um, uh, consent issues, if nothing else. Um, and then, um, secondly, from the IRB side, helping figure out how to take the ethics and the regulations and support researchers to encourage research. And my perspective is the IRB's role is not only to protect human subjects, but to help researchers do the right thing and conduct really good research to move whatever the field is forward. Um, most of my experience is in the biomedical side, but um, in the school public, so we were the IRB for the School of Medicine, School of Public Health, and the Dental School, and the School of Public Health has all this stuff that you guys are proposing. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mentioned a little bit about my um, my background the other day, but uh, just to, to give you some context, so I come from the social behavioral side, social behavioral educational research side, so we hope that we can kind of complement uh, each other in, in this uh, presentation. So early on, um, back in 99, I was writing my dissertation and using uh, online focus groups to study a bioethics, um, a bioethics <coughs> cohort. And at the time, it, you know, uh, the IRB was like, "Well, you know, what do you, what do you mean? Are you are you going to be meeting with people? You know, what are you what are you going to be doing?" And and so I said, "Well, no, we're you know, I'll be observing, you know, uh, uh, virtually and watching what they're doing, and then doing these online focus groups." And you know, it, again, now it seems so so like what's the problem? But then they weren't quite sure, you know, wh what were some of the issues of privacy, confidentiality, uh, you know, what, how, did, how do we study in virtual spaces? So at that point, I was, I was just finishing my, my dissertation and they said, well, why don't you help us, you know, write some, some guidelines or write some best mm -hmm. practices for researchers in these spaces. There had started to be a, you know, a, 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 a body of literature coming out, but nothing from the IRB specific side. So, uh, so I wrote some guidelines that, that got used, and then um, uh, a number of years later, um, wrote a, did a book on um, uh, online research ethics that was how I met Brenda. Um, many, this was back in what, 2002, three? No, maybe. Was that number? <laughs> <laughs> no, it had, it had to be probably no. 11, maybe? Maybe 11. 10, 11, 10, okay. Yeah, 10, okay. 11. It just feels like we've been friends. Okay, <laughs> which is good. Uh, so did a book and then uh, got a couple of uh, National Science Foundation grants to, to do um, work on IRBs and uh, online research. Um, and then wrote some guidelines for what's called the Association of Internet Researchers and then uh, SACCARP, which is sec the Secretary's Advisory Committee to OHRP, uh, got very interested in, in online research. So this kind of all happened in you know, the, the aughts and early um, um, 2000 you know, teens and so forth. So that's kind of where I've been. Um, 
I then have, so I've been on the research side, I've been an IRB chair, I've been an IRB vice chair, and in the past couple of years I've moved into our research office as the as an administrator. So I kind of have like the whole, the whole uh, you know, yeah. just like Sue, this progression where, I, and I think that's really helpful for really helping you to understand what we're going to look for, what your IRBs are going to look for. Each one is unique, each mm -hmm. one has its own, you know, kind of nuances and glitches and so forth, but um, but I think we'll, we'll try and help you mm -hmm. through um, from these various perspectives. So our question to you, who's submitted as a PI? Okay. As a PI. As a, as a PI. Like dissertation. Your dissertation. Uh, dissertation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. At your right. current institution. Mm -hmm. Not at your current? Derek. Okay. Derek, you have... What, what challenges have you experienced? Anything? Have you had anything that surprised you from your IRB? Okay. Sure. okay. Um, I mean, at my institution, I mean, so that at the PI, but definitely did more of the IRB protocol than the PI. <laughs> sort of because not being the PI actually means that I'm doing much more of the nitty gritty of writing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, I mean, in my experience, actually, when I was at Rutgers doing my dissertation, like, it was, like, really difficult. Like, I had a lot of issues with my dissertation research. And at Columbia, at the medical center, like, it's so different. Like, like it's actually, like, much more, it's much quicker mm -hmm. and, like, easier. And, like, even in the, I mean, we didn't, do, I, I haven't done a study of, like, Sex club yet there, but you know we have a grant on sex workers, so you know we could have had like a, a lot of issues come up. I mean, I would have expected a lot of issues to come up around like interviewing people who do like again illegal activity. Sure, sure. None of that uh, came through. So. Can I ask you a question? Did yeah. it go through the medical IRB or the social behavior? It's at, at Columbia. It's um, okay. it's it's on the medical the campus. Because mm. one of the things I know yeah. with Penn, Columbia might be different. Of course, is we have. They have so many different IRB boards, and yeah. I know, like personally, I would have, you know, a colleague study who was, you know, maybe doing a medication trial or doing something, and it would go through the medical IRB, and I thought, yes, you know, <laughs> and I submitted something that I thought was going to be very simple, and they <coughs> rerouted it, even though I collect mm -hmm. medical, they rerouted it to the social behavior one, who had more traditional, like all of these questions, a lot mm -hmm. more questions, yeah. and so, mm -hmm. so you may, may just be careful. You don't know. Which who's going to get it, even if you recommend it. Mm -hmm. And so the mm -hmm. social behavior ones, they typically have more yeah. questions. Yes. The other thing that we found over the years is that the when you work with a, 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 a well-funded PI, mm -hmm. who the IRB knows over many mm -hmm. decades, yeah. they then treat okay. our fellows differently. <laughs> Our fellows could be doing it. We, we had one fellow doing this ex yeah, almost exact, it's same population, same age, but because it was new, a new person doing it, they looked at it very differently. So, you you know, you all, all of you should be familiar. You're in a different uh, situation because you're, you're yourself. Um, but, uh, you know, so be careful about that. Do not assume that the way you've been writing for the person you work for, or the way they've been writing, because they're doing shorthand by now, because they've been mm -hmm. doing the same thing for so long. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to be careful about that. Um, you know, they're gonna be looking at, at you differently. Then for some of you, you've already done international research in Malaysia, right, at your site. You're, you know, I don't know how much research they've done in India and the type you're doing. So. What that means is, even if you have a really receptive IRB, you still have to educate them so that they're not asking you questions mm -hmm. that's taking months to answer just mm -hmm. because they don't need. Right. And, and part really because part of what the IRB it wants to ensure too is is that the the researcher proposing this project has the adequate training and, and qualifications mm -hmm. to engage in in the work that you're doing. You know, you're not going to walk into something with you know no no context, no background. So that's that's really why it's it's important to to you know with your lit review that you provide in your protocols. You know, really make sure they know that that you know what you're doing in those spaces. Any other challenges, comments that you want to share at this point? Um, I, my comments usually just come back like, 
um, like technical things with, um, you know, especially when the certificates of confidentiality became automatic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the IRB, uh, in the IRB application to ask you, are you gonna obtain one? So we went back and forth for a while about like, yes or like do I click yes or no because it's already automatic it's in the, and then you got to revise the consent form and then the school updated the consent form so it's just like <laughs> when yeah. federal regulations for um, you know compliance and ethics change then the IRB right. has to catch up and the so system has to catch up. Can you say a little bit more about automatic? So, so, the, so, so mm -hmm. NIH is automatically giving substance use research Certificates of confidentiality, so you don't have to at request one. You don't have to apply for so federally funded. Federally funded. Federally funded. Federally funded. What do you mean? Yeah. How do they know you're doing something? I knew they were paying for all one, so they got it for all the. For, for all, all of them. them. Yeah. For all. For all of them. But it has to be funded by NIH. Yes. yes. Federally funded. Mm -hmm. yes. Federally funded. Yes. So if you're so. not federally funded, then you need to request one, right. yeah. just like you did the OAS. We can talk you about that in a minute. It's a different type of. Yeah. I don't think it. I can't. Or they just have to let their institution know that. Well, if they're doing a sub study of what? That's a good question. I think we need to find out. You may be doing a sub study, but I don't know. No. No. Okay, so very, anyhow, mm -hmm. can you help mm -hmm. us with yeah. that? Yeah, we'll get to that in just, yeah. we have a slide on that, so if you want to, we can come back to that. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, I don't know the answer about this, but. Okay. Yes. All right, so so let's let's move on. And what Derek was referring to was the, the revised common mm -hmm. rule. Um, so it, we've been operating under a new set of guidelines since uh, since January. <laughs> it was a long, um, very, um, so I was going to use the word saga, but <laughs> process, uh, very painful along the Starting way. Starting in 2011, it's the first time regulations have essentially have been changed since 1991. Yeah. Well, yeah. the common rule was 91. Yeah. So. Yeah, so, so some of the things that you want to pay attention to, and you know, we're not training you to be on IRBs here, but, but be aware of there's a, a single IRB mandate. So if you are doing collaborative <coughs> research, uh, NIH's S, uh, single IRB went into effect a couple of years ago. With the revised common rule, the single IRB mandate goes into effect in 2020. So if you are working um, you know, across uh, institutions, you'll want to make sure with your grant applications that you're addressing the single IRB mandate. Um, your grants office, your IRB office would be able to help you with that. We don't want to try and you know, navigate your own institutions, but, but be aware that this is uh, so What you should be doing, let me just say, please be taking notes about, as it's occurring to you, what you should be asking your IRB, because one of the things we require <coughs> is that when you leave here, you make an appointment with your IRB right. to tell them what you are doing and, and what they think. So, right. you know, the, these kinds of, um, you know, issues that, that you just raised, for example, for those doing international research, what mm -hmm. does single IRB mean, if anything, at this point? It's mm -hmm. early, but, you know, right, it, yeah, just be making right, notes yeah. that it may be irrelevant, and, but mm -hmm. these are things to talk to your IRB about. Yeah. And, and, go ahead. and just like Derek said, IRBs are trying to figure this out and, and catch up kind of thing. So what was true six months ago when you last submitted may not be true now. So use your IRB office, your IRB staff, as people to help you. And I think that one of the biggest challenges that I'm hearing uh, when people are submitting grants you have to address the single IRB in your grant application. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, it, you're, you're gonna mm -hmm. kind of get mm -hmm. kicked out. So, you know, be aware, uh, again, your grants office and your IRB office don't always, you know, talk to each other. Right. And so make sure you're that link, making, can, making sure that both sides are aware of what you're, what you're doing. And understand that a single IRB requirement for your grants, it, um, is going to require um, a legal agreement between multiple institutions, mm -hmm. and that always slows everything down. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 If, if you have questions about this, I, I'll be happy to talk to you kind of offline. Um, I've done but this doesn't go into effect till then. No, the NIH it's is now. already it's in so effect. Yeah. That's so, the problem, yeah. okay. is that we thought so, it was gonna be next year, but and it's does not, it it's now. Does it refer to international work? 
It's collaborative research, so what if there's the same protocol being done at different institutions? Does it refer internationally And internationally, as well? I, I think But what if you are like yeah. here, these uh, yeah. our fellows are simply doing an international site. For my case, they ask if I would require IRB application to be submitted to the University of Malaya. Yeah. Okay. And okay. I said, basically, I mean, for my particular research, it was just online, and I didn't really need to go to Malaysia. Nothing was involved, so. Are you sure the Malaysian Department of Health is in agreement with that? Or whoever the regulatory body is? We usually go through UM. Uh, we've done surveys like that before. Um, it's just that we don't put anything re related to Malaysia. It's just that uh, we're doing um, an online survey is with Malaysian MSM. But and I did talk in uh, in detail about this with the IRB at Yale, and they mm. they did mention that um, I do not have to go through the UM, and they approve the uh, online okay. survey. Okay. Okay. Good. Good question. Okay. okay. Yeah. For. Um, uh, it was much harder for me to go through IRB at University of Chicago than it has been here at Fordham, mm -hmm. so that's been much nicer. The way that I've done it for uh, both my dissertation research and just this new project that's in Pakistan that, that has gotten IRB approval um, was getting, they call it an internal ethics committee mm -hmm. in India, in so, yeah. mm -hmm. um, so it'll be at the partner institution that, mm -hmm. I'm, that I'm working with, and so they meet like, you know, pretty much like an IRB would meet here on a monthly basis. Um, so I get a, a letter from them, and whenever I've provided that, both to Chicago and here, it's kind of streamlined the process, because okay. they right. see that, okay, this other institution has already cleared it. And, and it's like a letter of support, essentially. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. but it's, it's really requesting that the local IRB, or ethics committee, um, assesses right. the local yeah. context. Mm -hmm. right. Because how does anybody at Fordham know what the social context of this kind of research sure. is in India, southern India, or in Malaysia. So how, how would it, how does it fit into the cultural context in that local um, place? Right, right, right. Okay. Um, and we, at, at Boston University, we, even before it was required, we would try to contact the local <coughs> ethics group to get that cultural mm -hmm. context, to make sure that we weren't doing something that was rude or mm -hmm. inappropriate or mm -hmm. that our researchers weren't. So it's really I important, even if not required. Yeah, yeah I think with the, particularly with India, uh, I'm not so sure about Malaysia, but I know when I lectured through, through, uh, throughout India for a, a bit, you know, the, the concern was much more on the medical side. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and so when, when I started talking about some of the social behavioral stuff, they were like, oh, you know. You know. But, I, but I think the, the, the spaces that you're in are, mm -hmm. are so blurred, you right. know, between the medical and the social behavioral. So yeah. I, I think it'll I be. I don't think there's, I mean, at, at least at the institution that I partner with doesn't have two distinct okay. ones. It's just, okay. just the institutions IRB. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Or internal. Yeah. 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 All right. Any other comments, questions? Um, we just wanted to, to say, though, you know, we're still talking about these same basic principles of, mm -hmm. of research ethics, um, you know, and we're going to walk through uh, what each of these mean in detail. Um, do you you can you know okay. this one because so it's when we, Okay, when we talk about um, respect for persons, you know, we've been talking about that a lot this week. Um, some of the, the considerations that we have uh, things about privacy, confidentiality, anonymity. Um, respect for persons, as we know, is, is articulated or codified through the informed consent process. And I think what, what I've heard a lot this week is, is that, that consent really is a process. It's not just this one time, you know, sign this paper and then we're done. But, but really this ongoing kind of discussion, negotiation. And, and from the IRB perspective, you know, we, we want that to be, um, a, you know, a healthy process. And we want it to be a healthy process when, when you need to come back to the IRB and say, I need modifications. You know, I, again, with, with Faith's example yesterday, you know, she didn't mm -hmm. expect to interview in a car. You know, the IRB is, is not there to impede research. It really isn't, you know, I think that that kind of stereotype is, I think changing, but I just remember, you know, early on it was like, oh God, the IRB, you know, and, and everyone dreaded it. 
But I, I, I think that we've done a good job, you know, as a profession to, to mm -hmm. real, you know, we're researchers too. Um, we're not there to stop research, but to, to enhance research. Um, so the, the, in, the informed consent process, um, what we think about, you know, when we, when we, when we ensure um, and assure people, our participants, that, that we are going to protect you. How are we going to protect you? What, what do we need? And I realized that that language of protection, you know, it, it does have that paternalistic um, um, mentality to it. But, but I think, again, there's, there's different ways of presenting these, these forms of protection. So when we talk about privacy, confidentiality, and this is what I was kind of pushing on, on yesterday with, with Roman, you know, in terms of the app and in terms of, of health research, um, MSM in Malaysia, you know, what are the norms? What are the, the privacy norms? What are the, what are the regulations for privacy? You know, are there health uh, regulations in place that, that are going to impact the, the research that you're doing, the kinds of questions, the data itself, the data security? Uh, pieces, you know, how, how are there federal or, or state laws, you know, that, that are going to um, dictate how you store your data, uh, the, the, your process of data, and so forth. So data uh, security and stewardship, really important to think about, you know, the, the, the whole lifespan of data. So from a, a data, you know, data perspective, and Brenda can talk to this too, you know, we, we don't just think about, you know, data in one state. We think, or in one um, form, I should say, but we think about data, you know, in, in creation, we think about data in process or in transit, you know, how are data moving from point A to point B? We think about data in use, right? And how are you analyzing the data? Who's working with it? And then data at, at its, at, how do you get rid of it? What are you gonna do with it? Is it going to be deleted? Is it going to exist forever, you know, on a cloud? And some of those questions, you know, are, are a little challenging because if you are using a, a commercial cloud, you know, make sure you understand what what the terms are, how long are the data going to exist, you know, what kind of, of regular backups, you know, all all those very kind of technical questions that, you know, if you're not sure, uh, as researchers talk to talk to IT, talk to someone, you know, in in computer science that might have a, a better understanding of of the data process, the data life cycle. And our IRB asks, and I don't know if yours does, when are you going to destroy the data? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And how? And how? Right. And and sometimes that might be I don't know. <laughs> you know, some sometimes you really truly might not know how you know what you're going to do. Brenda, when you work with commercial data sets, do you have have any? Oh well, yeah, we, we have lots of restrictions with commercial data sets, and even pulling public data. You do have to read the terms of service and understand what's going on. One of the, I remember on when I was serving on Penn IRB, one of the questions we had a lot sometimes for international and then off-site type interviews. But you know, you have the old school, like where are you gonna, you know, is it gonna be a password protected hard drive or that type of stuff. Which would but really a look, making sure that you know what your research assistants or either you're doing, like how is it, if you're using a trans, if you're using a, if you're transcribing it or you know, using a digital recorder, how is that going to be protected? If you're using a flash drive. When you're working with commercial data sets, or actually, I don't think anyone here is doing commercial mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. but you're going to be having lots of, or both of you probably be having some transit of data mm -hmm. coming internationally. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I'm going to assume that both of your universities have secure sites that you can send and receive, like a secure share. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would you probably can, talk you can to you. You, if you ever work with yeah. you, the, yeah. so you can set that up where you'll say that people will be able to upload it, so that allows for encryption end to end. Because mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in the U.S., we have some issues with um, you can hear more and more about about data being data. or content secure information being able to be lifted by other mm -hmm. government agencies, mm -hmm. and yes. this is going to be very sensitive information. So I would just, in my protocol, point out that we're going to be using mm -hmm. this secure form of data transport and encryption so that mm -hmm. people who are collecting your data and sending it to you or even communicating about the study, right. that you're gonna be using that. And that would show the IRB that you are thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. Um, just to come back uh, briefly then to the, the uh, COCs, as we said, these are now automatically issued. Well, but think about, well, 
Go ahead. How is the issue for NIH funded? NIH, NIH. yes. My question right. is, this is NIH funded to Cilia. No, but I think they're NIH, they're NIH, it's NIH funded to me, but they get us a contract, so it's NIH funded to Right, me. but then... But do I have to get it? I don't think so because we don't they're do not the IRB. Research. Yes. Yeah. 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 I would ask your I would I'm ask gonna ask program Chris officer. about that, yeah. but I, I don't think <laughs> okay. What we do want you to think about is is how would you explain these to your participants? Um, and there's here's just a little bit of stock language. You know, this is what you might put in a consent form. Um, the study is supported by NIH, and, and then think about you know what what, what someone's not going to know what a COC is. How right. are you going to use lay language to explain it to them? If and your study is not funded, here's some language. The IRB may still require you to uh, to obtain a COC. And, and your institution may have boilerplate language yes. to help, mm -hmm. uh, to explain. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, we want to move on to beneficence. <clears throat> sure, beneficence really looks at risks and a risk-benefit relationship, and are the risks reasonable in relationship to the benefit? Um, one of the issues with risks, and this will help you if you can um, Enunci elucidate this for your IRB and your IRB application is that the definition of risk includes both the magnitude of the risk and the probability of that risk. So in biomedicine, the risk of death, magnitude quite large, probability quite small, um, as opposed to um, new medication, rash, high probability low magnitude. So if you can separate out or, or give information, data, empirical data, to the IRB about both the magnitude and the probability of a risk, that would be helpful. Also know that some of your studies may be minimal risk studies and there is a regulatory definition for minimal risk that is rigidly interpreted under current administration, has been for the last 20 <laughs> plus years, okay? And that is the minimal risk definition, even if it's, if the risks seem minimal to your participants, you have to put that in the language of the regula regulatory definition for your IRB. And the minimal risk means that the probability and the magnitude of harm or discomfort anticipated in the research are not greater in and of themselves than those ordinarily encountered in daily life or during the performance of routine physical or psychological examinations or tests. The questions that you're asking people and the probably psychological risk as opposed to physical risk, but some of your subjects may be, participants may be under some physical risk by participating in your study. You have to think about that, but it's not and this is the glitch in, in the current interpretation, is that it's not encountered in their daily life, okay? Because the, the things that you're asking them are questions that are probably, the risks that are assumed from your questions are um, probably consistent with their daily lives, which are different risks, I think, than my daily life. But the, defi the interpretation of this daily life is the daily life of an average person, not your subject population, okay? So you have to put, it, put your description of risks in that context. Brenda? One of the things I do for this section to my consent forms, if I have, I mean, I have my consent, my protocols, if I have the data, uh -huh. is so let's say that we're using a, you know, our typical battery or intake or right. something typical. I will point out that you know we've used this in blah 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 studies before and give the protocol mm -hmm. number and say that we've not experienced any of these. Mm -hmm. That's right. Any yeah. problems? Um, if we had, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. And this is just to let. People but I also think my experience has been uh, two things. Number one, that in sexual health research, you really want to make the argument that these are sexual health questions that are standard in a, in a medical mm -hmm. setting. Yeah. They're part of the standard mm -hmm. medical setting. Okay, so that's very important to, to say in yeah. the countries also perhaps where 
where, right. where you are. Right. But the other thing is, and I don't know, I haven't been able to see if it's still linked, but in the definition of minimal risk, there's also a link to examples of minimal risk, and one of the sentences in that, in that link is, if confidentiality protections are put into place, it is still minimal risk. So that's mm -hmm. also important because for a lot of our populations, the mm -hmm. sex worker, you know, there are all these mm -hmm. different kinds of vulnerable populations to confidentiality, like your study, but if you demonstrate that, that the confidentiality protections of the study itself reduces the risk to minimal, then it should be. Not that every yes. IRB follows that, yeah, yeah. but right. if you yes. cite the, yeah. you know, yes, I'll, yes. I'll get, I'll get okay. the link if it's still there. And the more that you can cite right. those right. kinds okay. of, yeah. of uh, uh, justifications, the smoother your application will go through the process. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, so we think about risks, and we're going to have each of you in, the, in a little bit talk about the risks anticipated in your studies. But what are the benefits to the studies? What, what are the benefits? What's the benefit to your study? Because the risks have to be reasonable in relationship to the benefits. What are the benefits to the study? To the MRP. To the MRP study, yeah, to your MRP. To the participant? Well, that, think that's of, Think yeah. about, yeah. much like, um, Face, yeah, the three, the um, different the levels. The sort of levels yesterday, yeah. the benefits can accrue to what? To whom? To the individual participant, to the participant's community, to general knowledge, society. So what are the benefits to your study? Why are you doing your study? Who's it going to okay. help? Oh, let's we'll start. Um, Thanks, so maybe yeah. um, potentially to for my study to potentially improve uh, the provision of HIV services for this particular population, so that it can maybe shift um, the way, hopefully, programs are funded to do work. So what the service what? level? Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me talk specifically about benefits the MR, to the research. The benefits to the MRP. Right. Even for the even for the MRP, though, I think that that. Okay, all right, I can, I can just say the exact same thing and maybe <laughs> not use the word services and use the word research. So perhaps to better be able to tailor um, how we do research with this particular population um, so that it's more attentive to the community's particular needs. Good, okay. good, that's exactly where I wanted you to go. Rum? For my case, I think the, the information that we'll, we'll find out from the MRP project will be, we'll be able to use that part information to come up with a better app um, or, and which will be helpful for the community or the people who will be using it in the future. Well, once again, I, I, think, I think that's true, but it's the law, you know, you're, you're, you're saying how this will improve the right. larger study, which in turn will improve the life mm -hmm. if that right. study works out. Um, but I think you could all argue that um, recruitment of, of vulnerable populations, like the ones mm -hmm. that, that you're studying, is, is often difficult. And one of the reasons is, is that um, the, the perceived risks and benefits that uh, investigators may, may think are there are not necessarily the ones that the participants are mm -hmm. thinking about. And because of that, these populations are invisible to research, and they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're understudied. And the, the purpose of, of this study is to find out more how we can tailor research to the needs of these vulnerable communities so that they can, they can also benefit from empirically supported uh, interventions and treatments. And frequently by, by understanding a participant's perspective and a participant's perceived risks and benefits. And that Hopefully, your data from your MRP will help inform the IRB in its assessment of risks and benefits going forward in this line of research. Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on. Uh, the third principle of justice. And, and we want to push you to, to think about, you, you've all identified a population. Mm -hmm. um, and we want you to, to be able to really articulate who, who is your intended audience and why. 
you know, why why are you working in Malaysia? Why are you working in Hyderabad? You know, why? why? What is the, the justification? And, and when we think about the enrollment criteria, um, we want it to be scientifically justified, right? We don't want it to just be like, well, you know, that uh, there's some random reason for me working in Malaysia or, or Hyderabad. You know, what is the scientific justification? And, and do the demographics matter? And, and so, so we will point, we were talking about you last night, Derek, and we were saying, you know, do the demographics of, of, in Baltimore, how, how, do they, how do they play into your study, for example? You know, there, there's what, East Baltimore and West Baltimore, you know, and, and does your study address both? And so when we think about demographics, we're thinking about, you know, not, not just, you know, you know, this homogenous pool of individuals. We're thinking about, you know, what is the racial, the gender makeup, the, the geographical makeup. Uh, SES orientation, educational levels, and so forth. You know, and, and, and so why why do the demographics matter? You know, we want to justify those in a in a scientific uh, manner. And then your recruitment methods. We want to think about you know is, is are your recruitment methods how you're planning to recruit? Are they going to get you to the population that you need to a scientifically justifiable or valid population? You know how what what how will you be approaching people? How how are you going to get the population that you need? So what we'd like we'd like you to think about is, I mean, you've done research in these populations before. Your recruitment methods. We want to move you out of the rote. Mm -hmm. And if you had to describe why you chose the population, justify why you chose the population, why these recruitment methods are the right ones, how would you justify it? what data, what experience, so to be able to absolutely explain every step of the way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? And the more you can explain why, the easier your IRB application is going to yeah. go. We, we, we raised this question, you know, are the principles of, of research ethics drawn from the Belmont Report, are they adequate? You know, and there's been tons of literature, you know, debating the, the principles and so forth. Um, Dr. Fisher brought up other um, provisions throughout the week, you know, the, the fiduciary, the relational, um, integrity. You know, there are other principles that we want to, to uh, embody in our research. Um, and it, to that end, there was one article that we put in, in the um, drive about doing ethics, and this is a, uh, she's a, a digital um, humanities scholar that I've worked with, Annette Markham, and, and sh I like the article, and I, I shared mm -hmm. it first with Sue and said, what do you think, you know, it's not really in your domain, um, but I like the way she talks about, you know, the current structures, the, the historical foundations of research ethics, uh, and they're kind of um, how she calls them, the, the error avoidance or the concept driven, and they're, they're much more the, the top-down model that we're used to. It's the, you know, the a priori approach. Um, and, and we want to kind of push you, you know, we want you to, to, to embrace the regulations, but we also want you to be, you know, really good ethical researchers. You know, and ethics and regulations are, are you know, hopefully in, in sync, Not right? <laughs> they should be. Uh, you know, and, and so our, your, your MRP should provide uh, empirical data for, for the IRB on what the participant perceived risks and benefits are. That's bringing a, a different uh, perspective to the IRB, and that's reiterating what Sue just said. You know, how, how do you make the IRB understand, you know, your participants are embracing this research, and, and here's why. So your MRPs are critical. Uh, and, and this is just, you know, we put this in all caps, so we're yelling at you, scientifically valid empirical data are critical. You know, this is what you want to relay to the IRB. We're, we're trying to, we have, we're trying to watch our time because we want to make sure we have, have time for you guys. This is just a, a couple of quotes, you know, and, and I really like, Sue said this to me yesterday, and it's just, my, my mentor in the IRB world. Um, when I took over the IRB as an administrator as opposed to the, a, a chair or a member, he said to me, figure out what the right thing to do is and then figure out if the regulations can fit. So the ethics drove the regulatory decisions. Not all IRBs function that way mm -hmm. and part of that is out of fear of uh, retribution, retribution mm -hmm. um, from federal agencies. Mm -hmm. um, but 
in in your work, let your ethics drive um, your research, and then work with the IRB to see how the regulations came in. Okay, mm -hmm. so it really requires a dialogue and a relationship with your IRB. What we have found is the majority of people are fellows. It takes months mm -hmm. for their IRB approval, even though they don't think it, and that's why some of them don't start till January, February, right. it's too late. And it's, it's you know, I, it's, we can't stress yeah, this enough, so. how important, you know, how important yeah. it is to go and talk to your IRB director, whoever it is, once you, you know, get the proposal in shape, even in August, before you do, this is what I'm doing. This is how it's being funded. You know, it's funded through a <coughs> subcontract from Fordham University. This is, you know, and, and what do you see or any of the challenges? What should I be thinking about? And I'm going to talk about that about your budget officer, too, because mm -hmm. that's really important. Mm -hmm. But I, I can't stress enough for most people the biggest barrier, you write your proposal, and then you just wait a month. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so because of time, we're going to skip the case discussions because we want to get to the exercise. But the one thing, both cases um, that we had here, is that sometimes your IRB will request changes to your study design. And that's not uncommon. And sometimes they seem quite reasonable. Be sure, the words of wisdom from both cases are be sure that your changed study design is going to answer the research question that you set out to answer. Because sometimes the IRB, in all good intent, will request a change that then ultimately changes the research question that's being answered. Mm -hmm. And that may not be useful to knowledge, society, the community, okay? And we can, if you're interested, we can go over the cases later on, but we want to get to the exercise because that's going to help, that's focused on yours. And that is, we want you to take out a piece of paper and you're going to start writing. Or your computer, right? Or your computer, yeah. But we want you to actually do this. We're going to give you 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. We want you to write the beginning of the consent form, the part of the consent form where you are going to explain to, to your potential participants, these are boilerplate, I'm sure in your institutions, boilerplate sections of your consent form. You're being asked to be in the study because in this study you will answer questions, you know, blah, blah, blah. In this study you may experience and as a result of the being in the study, you may benefit something. You forgot so purpose. We thought that might that be a little too long. You want you well, we can add. put I want in a sentence. The, the okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, it, frequently that's you are being asked to be in the study because you have HIV, and we are studying um, the use of whatever. As so I, population and yeah your, yeah, your research question has to be in the population thing. Maybe we can add that in. Sure. Yes. Well, I would just have, I, I always started off, as I think I, I mentioned, I always start off as the purpose of this research is to, um, you know, is to attempt to improve the way that studies are conducted with whatever your population is. And, and to do that, we want to ask, you know, we're going to gather your, your opinions. That, you know, mm -hmm. that's usually mm -hmm. the first right. thing, yeah. right? Yeah. And well, then we, you we are flip being it. asked to be in this study because, you know, we, and then that, yeah. We actually, I think our template flips it. Do you want us to follow? Um, yeah. If we have our Your template? template? Yeah. Sure. But the, just, we just the, the yeah. question, the population, the procedure, the risks, oh, and the, right. and the uh, benefits. Because those are the hard parts. Mm -hmm. And then, so you have 10 minutes to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and why are we and doing in this? In lay I, terms. Yeah, I just want to say, when I started in IRB work, one of my mentors said to me, the first thing you need to do is write your consent form. Because that, that's what is, is important. That's who, what your, participate, your participants are going to see. They're not going to see the protocol. They're not going to see all the details. So, so this is what you're presenting. How do you make your participants understand? 
And when I review a protocol from an IRB perspective, I read the consent form, then I read the protocol, yes. the rest of your application, then I read the consent form again. Mm -hmm. Oh, you start with the I start, I start with, with the consent, consent form. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. What are you telling yes. participants? Yes. Then I go back and look at your protocol, so your the rest of your application. Then I go back yeah. and review the consent form again. But yeah, yep. that's. Yeah. So you've got 10 minutes to do that, and then there's a second part of the exercise, obviously.